Welcome back to our very last episode of the Cross Border Interviews Municipal Month, and we are pleased and honored to sit down with our current guest. He is the third mayor for the Halifax Regional Municipality, and he has graciously accepted an offer to come on the show to talk about himself, but also his community. And I'm pleased and, to, uh, pleased and honored to welcome Mayor Mike Savage. Uh, mayor Mike, thank you so much for doing this. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for reaching out. So before we get started, I've asked the same question to every elected official and every candidate to be elected. Uh, where'd your sense of duty to serve come from, Mayor Mike? Well, I think people would say, and I wouldn't argue that it comes from my family. My, my, uh, my father was a politician, but he was an accidental politician. He was a social activist. He, he was uh, Welsh, uh, Irish. Um, my mother was Irish. I grew up, I was born in Belfast. Um, came over here at a very young age, had a whole family and everybody was very, fam uh, the whole family was very service oriented, very much into social justice issues. My father was an activist in um, drug addiction and counseling and um, putting medical clinics into a, a, an area of our community that had been the victim of systemic racism in the Preston areas of Halifax. Um, was just very involved in, uh, in uh, issues of social justice. And I think I'm one of his seven kids, and I think we've all um, we've all inherited the passion of both of our parents uh, for trying to improve the community for our families, but for the wider community. You uh, you could have chosen many different avenues to give back with your duty to serve, whether it be through nonprofits, through volunteerism. You chose a, uh, federal politics and municipal politics. Uh, I, I, I'm not I'm not sure about you, but for me, what my father and mother did, I tried to do the complete opposite to their chagrin. But you chose the political route. Why was politics such an important factor to get into to help that service to your community for you? Well, I think all of us resisted in some ways the, um, <laughs> the gravitational pull. My father was a doctor more than anything else. <clears throat> that's what his profession was. And that's where his uh, passion for social justice led him. And that's where he did a lot of his work. And none of us strayed into the field of medicine or, or really came very close. I have a sister who, who studied OT for a while, but not, not very seriously, I don't think. Um, so I don't think, I never felt I needed to be an elected politician. Uh, I wasn't elected for the first time till I was um, 44 years old. And I generally have more faith in people who go into politics after they've done something else and have experienced other things in the world before they go into elected office. Um, but I was certainly involved in community activities, uh, poverty issues, literacy um, issues, uh, some business um, issues. Um, so it was those things, and I was involved in, in um, supporting and organizing campaigns. Um, my wife would vigorously dispute this idea, but I don't think I needed to be in elected office. Um, but, um, you know, I ran in 1997 in my mid-30s uh, for the Liberal Party. Jean Chrétien was the prime minister, and uh, I was proud to do that. Uh, Atlanta, Canada got wiped out in that election, the Liberal Party. We lost all the seats in Nova Scotia after holding them all in 1993, and I don't I became the president of the Liberal Party down here, very involved nationally. But I don't think I needed to get elected um, if it wasn't for um, my relationship with Paul Martin, and uh, who I liked for a long time and considered somebody I had a great deal of respect for, a friend. And he asked me to consider running in 2004. And that's really why I ran. I didn't feel it was the only way I could contribute, but I felt at that point in time that that was the best way for me to contribute. While I would love to sit here and talk to you about your time in federal politics, I want to stick to the municipal politics because that's what the whole month is about. And in 2012, after time as a federal MP, 2011 came, you were defeated in that election. And then in 2012, you decided that you would move from federal politics to municipal politics. Um, was it an easy choice? Because I've had politicians on the show talk about their time in municipal politics going up to federal, but never vice versa. And yourself and uh, along with Edmonton Mayor Amarjeet Sohi have done the opposite. Well, he was municipal, he went to federal and went back to uh, municipal. For you, was it an easy decision or was there an underlying issue in the Halifax Regional Municipality that you thought to yourself, I need to address this and I believe I'm the only voice that can? Yeah, it's a good question. So after I 
involuntarily resigned from federal politics in 2011. Um, I didn't feel the need to get back into politics. <clears throat> I had been in business. I wanted to go back into business. I did. I started with a company here. That was my intent. But I did believe uh, after being prevailed upon by a number of people. From, and, and what I liked was it was across the political spectrum. You always hear that. Hey, municipal politicians say, oh, they all support me. But people like Alexa McDonough, who I served in the House with, um, you know, people, um, uh, you know, there was a, Senator Stephen Green called me right after the election. Uh, you know, Stephen and I probably wouldn't agree on that many things, but he was very supportive of the idea of me uh, running for public office um, and, and for mayor. And it was my view at that time that Halifax was underperforming, that our ambition was not high enough, that with all the natural and earned advantages that the city had built up, being one of the best natural harbors in the world, having some of the best universities in Canada, um, having the location that we have, having the young talent that we have, I felt we were not reaching high enough and I felt that I could maybe mobilize across the political spectrums and, um, and get stuff done. I would say this, that the old traditional farm system of politics has been upended. It used to be that you went from being, you know, school board, maybe provincial, and then you'd go, uh, or school board, maybe municipal, then provincial, federal, but it's not just Emma Jig and I. I mean, John Tory was the leader of the Conservative Party in Ontario. Bonnie Crombie was in the House of Commons with me. Ed Holder was in the House of Commons with me. Kennedy Stewart was in the House of Commons with me. There's a whole host of people that have realized, as I did, that, you know, the shit really happens at the municipal level. And if we can get away from some of the encumbrances of provincial and federal politics, particularly the partisan uh, ties and baggage that come with it, one of the great joys of being mayor is meeting other mayors from around the world and seeing how mayors are problem solvers. We're not tied into outdated dogmas. And I find that mayors are, are uh, you know, very idealistic, but not as ideological as other uh, politicians. And I find that very appealing. And having run for mayor, I wouldn't go to any other order of government. It has no interest to me anymore. I respect the work they do. I know how hard other politicians work. But for me, the best way to contribute is at the municipal level and working with colleagues in FCM and with the big city mayors that I've worked with in the last little while. It's only reinforced that view. I want to I want to jump on. I want to stay on this line of thinking here for a second, if you don't mind. And I want to ask about that uh, local governments, because you had that federal experience. You talked about all the other politicians who had provincial and federal pol uh, experience before going municipal. Um, you when you get elected municipally, you don't have that partisanship that you see federally or provincially or even in the Senate. So for you, when you first got elected, and I want to make sure I get this right here in 2012 as mayor, was yeah. there a switch that you just clicked and said, OK, I'm no longer partisan Mike Savage liberal. I am Mayor Mike Savage of the Halifax Regional Municipality. Yeah, I, I, it, it wasn't so much a switch that I triggered. It, it just happened organically. I just realized I felt liberated. Um, I felt like I wasn't encumbered to um, to other political masters. And, and, and in some ways, it's frightening because you have nobody else to blame but yourself if you make a mistake. You can't blame your colleagues in caucus. Um, it, it's you. It's all you. You put your name on the ballot. If I run for mayor and if I lose... You know, then I can't say, as people have said about the 2011 election, well, don't worry, it wasn't you. They didn't like the leader, didn't like the party. It's all you. And I think municipal politics is much more uh, difficult, much more frustrating, but 10 times more rewarding um, than other forms of office. Because particularly in a situation like ours, where we don't, we've never really in my time when council had had clicks on council that it was always, you know, a, a, a nine to seven vote or anything like that. Uh, everybody had to start at the, at the beginning. And what I, one of the things I like about municipal politics that you don't see in the other orders of government is we change our mind when we listen to debate. We go to a city council meeting and I'm often influenced, you know, there's, there's people on my council right now, there's 16 councillors and myself I'm not the smartest person on council uh, by a long shot. I sure as heck don't know the most about municipal uh, planning. Um, I'm, I'm not the expert on too many things, but one of the things Alexa McDonough told me when I asked her why she was pushing me to run for mayor, and I said, you know, Alexa, I don't know much about potholes and snow clearing and cutting the grass on fields. And she said, no, no, you get staff. 
the staff will do that. What they need is somebody who can come up and lead and provide some kind of a vision. And I think you get to do that um, as a mayor and as a counselor. And I've been fortunate to work with a lot of really good counselors, uh, most of whom have been very progressive. And, and even those who aren't progressive in the sort of political sense have the best interest of the city at heart. And they don't go back to their caucuses uh, to sort of get an opinion. They, they listen to their colleagues. You know, One of the things that always struck me is backwards about federal politics was we would have a caucus meeting to decide our position on an issue going into the debate. And that's just you know, innately illogical. You know, if you're going to have a debate, then you should be prepared to listen to it. You should be prepared to be influenced. I've been influenced. I've changed my mind on, on things that have come to council by listening to my colleagues. So I like that. I find it liberating. Um, and um, it's challenging and it's busy, but it's, it's a, I think it's the most pure form of democracy that we have in uh, Canadian politics. There is a weight and responsibility that mayors and local councillors have when they first get elected and when they are still elected, because you are the front line of politics. You're not going off to, for you, uh, Halifax, for uh, federally, it's uh, 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 Ottawa. You're not going off to another city. You are there in your city all times. And the decisions that you make around the council table affect not only your neighbours, your community members, but the day-to-day people that you go into their businesses how much responsibility is it for you that you have to make sure you steer the ship correctly so that way it doesn't impact the uh local grocer or the person down the street from you on a day-to-day basis with higher property taxes with changes to garbage pickup with changes to snow removal clearing because you will probably hear about that if a decision goes one way at the grocery store when you're going to pick up your groceries on a friday night yeah i think that's true um we we impact directly on people's lives um i would argue and i don't know if this is just my experience the way that i do the job um I'm involved less in constituency day-to-day matters as mayor than I ever was as an MP. As an MP, I I needed to know everything that was happening in the constituency. There's 16 districts, all of whom um, have councillors. And so I will sometimes get involved in individual issues, but I've tried in my time as mayor to be on the bigger issues, the economic development, uh, diversity and inclusion, attracting immigration, climate change, and that's just me. Um, other mayors, I think the mayor before myself was much more operational and less policy and strategic than I am. And he got elected three times. So there's different approaches for different uh, people. And I certainly, you know, I was uh, get involved in issues of people write and, and call. Um, but it's really important, the whole, the whole issue of balance. In Like, it's a lot busier job than being an MP. Being the mayor of Halifax is... I've got four or five MPs within my district and 20 provincial MLAs. And so the demands are, and people invite a mayor to things they would never invite an MP to. And as an MP, I didn't get invited to important things like dog shows and everything else. Um, so you have to have the balance, personal versus professional, but also how much of your time are you gonna spend on the big issues and how much are you gonna spend on on more operational things. And you have to work with your counselors. I always want the counselors to have the first crack at sorting out issues at the council level. Um, so yeah, the, but the issues we deal with, whether it's taxes, whether it's housing, um, you know, we, we did something dramatic this year in our budget. We put a 3% tax um, on property taxes for climate action. And we've had a pretty good record of keeping taxes low. That's a big deal for us, um, but I think it's the right thing to do and you have to be prepared to defend that explain it discuss it um how and, much is uh, communications a big priority for you yeah communications is a big part engagement is a big part of the job for sure um but you know you're just not going to please everybody and you know you have to there's that that's where balance comes in as well is like you know you, we need to be listening to our constituents that's our job and that makes us better politicians but there is not a single issue. I mean, you know, you couldn't get 85% of HRM to agree that today's Thursday. Um, it just doesn't happen. So, you know, you have to at some point in time. Climate change is a perfect example. We've argued about this back and forth. If people don't like the fact that we put a tax on, they think there's a better way to address the issue of climate, I'm all ears. But if someone's going to call up and say climate change isn't real, we've done that. 
that that's that's gone. You stick your head out the window and, and uh, during a hurricane. Uh, so, you know, there is a, a huge amount of communications, but the way we do policy at the municipal level is different. You know, provincially, federally, it's not even the whole caucus, usually not even a whole cabinet. It's the PMO or the premier's office with a few people that come together. They take an idea, they create it, they, they spin test it, they do all that. Then they bring it in and they vote for it. Everybody else votes against it and off you go. Here we do it publicly. Everything we do is public. Um, and is it better that way? Yeah, I think it is better that way. I absolutely do. I, I, I believe in the party system. I think there has to be a spine to the political system that you, know, you, you run on certain things in your political party and then you're held to those one way or the other. Sometimes you change your mind, sometimes you don't implement them, but you're judged on that. But that's the spine of that system. With us, it's different. And I think, you know, we had a discussion this week on Hockey Canada. We're hosting the World Junior Hockey Championships here in December. And we've been trying to figure out how do we deal with these, all the malfeasance of Hockey Canada and the inappropriate behavior of, of, of dealing with these, um, these, these claims against Hockey Canada, legitimate claims, which have not been dealt with transparently. We had our conversation completely in the open, in public. So do I think it's better? I do. I think it can be very tiring. Um, but I think it's better. I think it's more democratic, and I think it's uh, I think it's better for the population. I want to ask about one last segment, one last question in this segment. Then I'm going to move on to the region, the the the, uh, the Halifax, and that is work life balance. Because you will go to a restaurant, and people will know you are the mayor. People, you will go to the grocery store, you will know who the you are the mayor, and they will ask you about a range of issues, provincial issues, federal issues, because really, at the end of the day, as their elected official, as their uh, as your as the city's mayor, they are looking to you to address these issues. How much do you try to balance your work and personal life? Or are you always Mayor Mike, even if you're going to the grocery store? Or is there a time when you say, here's my business card. I'd love to talk to you, but can you call tomorrow because I'm out with my family right now and I want to have a sit down dinner with them? Well, you're tempted sometimes to say, here's my business card and then give them John Tory's business card uh, <laughs> and uh, have, them, have them call John. Um, he's got enough on his plate. You're all... So here's the thing. I can walk the streets of Halifax and I have been able to. We've had, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, four or five premiers since I've been mayor. I can walk the streets of Halifax. And generally, I, I don't I don't get accosted by people. Really? I certainly don't get a lot of negative. I don't get, I mean, I, people will come up. Yeah, they come up and talk and, you know, but I got to say, I'm knock on wood, it's generally very positive. And when I go to the grocery store, yeah. It, sometimes it takes a while, but I, I, I can tell you there's a local politician who's no longer a politician, who was a very popular person in, in their constituency, who told me one time it used to take them 15 minutes to get from the checkout at Sobeys to their car because they were talking to everybody. And it used to bother the family and everything else. Then all of a sudden, there was an issue that really hurt the reputation in the area. And he said, now I can do it in 15 seconds. And it was a lot better the old way. So as long as people want to talk to you, then I'm, I'm happy to have the conversation. Um, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't bother me. I'm not going to be mayor, you know, forever. Um, and, you know, there's, there's times that anonymity is a, a blessing. Um, but by and large, if people still want to talk to you, then I have the time to talk to them. I want to turn to the next segment, and that is about Halifax in a whole. And I want to preface this, que this these questions with this. This is a uh, conversation between the mayor and myself. This is his opinion. This is not a direction, a motion at council. This is just him and I talking. Your Worship, Mayor Mike, sorry. Um, what is the biggest issue facing the Halifax today, in your opinion? The issue, and I, I think this is common among mayors in Canada, when I talk to my colleagues, whether it's, uh, you know, John or, or Kennedy Stewart, Brian Bowman. Uh, Danny um, Breen says you know, Halifax is just trying to be St. John's uh, light. So oh, I, I spoke to him for yesterday's episode and he said Halifax is just uh, St. John's. It's just trying to punch above its weight and be St. John's. So he has a good rivalry with you, a friendly rivalry, he says. Yeah. Uh, no, Danny's a good fellow. My, my son went to school in his city for the last five years, graduated. St. John's is a, is a, is a great city. Um, so the issue that 
keeps me awake is housing and homelessness. And I think a lot of mayors would say the same thing. Um, particularly now, the pandemic didn't create these issues, but it certainly highlighted and exacerbated them. And so if you ask me what's on my mind the most, it would be those issues. They're, they're, they're linked, but they're not the same. There are people that simply don't have a place to live and we have, a, I think, an obligation to those people. And then making sure that for a city like Halifax, which is probably the fastest growing city in the past five years, it was the fastest growing downtown and it's been the fastest growing in population um, for a couple of years out of the last five and it's always near the top. Um, making sure we have the right housing. So we're attracting people from around the world. And, you know, in the last couple of years, we've been attracting people in unbelievable numbers from other parts of Canada. Um, so there's this old notion that Danny Green wouldn't be aware of, as would Amanda McDougall and Cape Breton and myself. There used to be this thing called going down the road where people used to leave Atlantic Canada and they go to Toronto, Calgary. Now they're coming back, and which is good. We just need a place for them to live. So this city is a buzz with development activity. I was just saying in the car to John, who works with me, we were coming back from a place. And I said, oh, my God, I didn't, I, I didn't even know what these are, these new buildings that are going up. It's, it's growing at a fast pace, but we need that to grow and we probably need it to accelerate. So housing and homelessness, environment and climate change are always overriding concerns. Um, we have a very good climate plan here. Uh, and so we had Hurricane Fiona a couple of weeks ago. Hurricanes are happening. And um, so the climate is a, um, a big issue. And as long as I've been mayor, we've been pushing economic growth and, and we wanna have good, inclusive, sustainable economic growth. But on a day-to-day -day basis right now, it would be uh, housing and homelessness. I, I, you mentioned uh, the hurricane twice now, and I wanna just ask, how has your community handled, uh, this is airing a, a week after recording, but how is your community doing? So we've done okay but that's not to say people haven't been hurt. Um, we have had significant damage to, to property here and we've uh, had people who've been badly impacted by Fiona, but you'd have to be um, obtuse not to look around the other parts of Atlantic Canada where houses are swept out into the ocean, uh, where communities and PEI are still without power um, three weeks after the, the hurricane. The North Shore of Nova Scotia and Cape Breton Island were um, you know, Amanda McDougall, who's an amazing mayor in CBRM, uh, is still trying to get trees off houses. And um, so we didn't get as badly banged as that, but we could have. I mean, the day before the hurricane, I was we did a press conference with the minister here uh, of emergency preparedness. And, you know, um, I think what I said was, this is going to smack us in the face. It all depends. There are veer it veers this way or that way. So, yeah. We got hit, spent the weekend in the emergency measures organization uh, office, uh, but it could have been worse. But the point is that all these storms that used to sort of wear out as they got to the you know middle of the continent of the United States, you know, the warm weather turned to cold weather and hurricanes began to die. The water's warmer. We're getting those hurricanes and they're going to come and we need to you know be ready for them. We need to mitigate against their damage and we also need help in cleaning up afterwards. I want to turn back to some of the issues that you spoke about. And thank you for answering that, uh, Mayor Mike. And I want to talk about housing, because that is an issue that you are not the first mayor or councillor to bring it up during this month-long series. How is Halifax dealing with this issue? What are you doing to attract development here? You talked about development that's going on, but growth is always growing, and it's not going to stop once development stops and the new developments that you're currently working on stop. You're always going to have to be dealing with this issue. So what is this uh, city doing to not just look at the here and now, but five years, 10 years down the line. So we have a very good economic plan that we do with our economic development agency, which is the Halifax Partnership. We've just redone it and it's called People, Planet, Prosperity. Um, and it's focused on inclusive growth and it's focused on sustainable growth. And for some time we have been looking at housing um, differently because one of the things that all people who are involved in, in governance these days have to understand, like right from the beginning is, the way we've always done things isn't working or else we wouldn't have the problems that we have today. So we can say, for example, in housing that our responsibility in housing is limited. It's a provincial responsibility, you know, housing, Nova Scotia, and certainly homelessness. Um, 
So, but in the last number of years, we bought in a number of measures, planning regimes to uh, spur both more, more building. Um, the downtown of Halifax, I mentioned, was the fastest growing downtown in Canada from 2016 to 2021. Uh, in part because of a planning regime that was called HRM by design, which came in before I was mayor, which said to developers, you know, you still have to design good buildings. You've got to go through a, an approval process on design, but this is the size and scope of what you can build. And when I look out my window now, I see buildings. I mean, most of what I see didn't exist when I became mayor. We've expanded that now to a whole other swath of our municipality with something that we call the center plan, which makes that easier and also drives affordability into the uh, process. We've allowed secondary and backyard suites. We're, you know, we're looking as everybody else is at the impact of Airbnb and coming in with regulations to say, we need to control Airbnbs. There's thousands of units that could be used for housing that are being um, you know, rented out. Um, I, wanna, I, wanna, uh, I wanna talk about development here for a second because I, I, I've lived in many large uh, urban centers. I've lived in rural communities as well. And the one thing I hear from uh, residents whenever I move into a city or a community is, we don't want the, the feel of the community to go away. So while we talk about growth and we talk about development, which is good and need it because cities need to grow, how do you still maintain that unique atmosphere that is HRM? Yeah. So first of all, I would argue that we have a very good development community. Most of our developers aren't uh, big numbered companies. They're local developers uh, from the Lebanese community, from the uh, Jewish community, from the Italian community, the Greek community, the, the, the Middle Eastern community, uh, Iran, Iraq, and they live here and they, they wanna walk around and more and more they wanna bike around and they wanna see the developments they have. So we've had good, um, good developments. And you know, the simple fact is, we, we need development. Uh, we need places for people to live. I don't believe you can be a stagnant city and, and claim success. Uh, I think you lose out if that's the case. If you're going to grow, then you need to grow in a, a sustainable way. And for us, it's you know densifying the core of the city where the services already exist, but also more and more having these complete communities outside the core of the city. And the key is that they have to be linked by transit and they have to have the services people need. We're no different than probably every other major center in Canada where for a long time, a developer might come in and say, I can build this community, I'll build the roads, I don't need a rec center, I don't need a library, I don't need any of those services. But as soon as people live there, they want a library, they want a rec center, uh, they want transit. Um, and so we need to make sure that development pays for uh, development. Um, and if we do that, that's a big success. So I, I think we you keep that, you know, but you know, Halifax is, you know, the, when the when Halifax, I mean, well, the Mi'kmaq have lived here for 13,000 years, you know, uh, the settlers have been here for, for centuries. Uh, the city's always evolving, but it's, it's, it's partly the built environment that we as the governors of the city have a responsibility to maintain, but it's also the people and the traditions. And I love the fact that I can walk down the streets of Halifax even today and hear a language I've never heard before in Halifax. I think we want to be an international city. We want immigrants to come here. We welcomed 1,100 or 1,200 Syrian refugees to our small city in 2016. We welcomed Afghanis. We welcomed Ukrainians. We welcome people from Bhutan. We welcome, and some of them come with money and some of them come with nothing but a desire in their heart and their mind to build a better life for themselves and their family. And they build our city uh, as well. So I think you, you maintain the sort of the heart of what the city is. But visually, it changes over time if it's successful. And I think that's okay. Uh, you talked about the different issues that you believe are facing the community. Uh, but at the end of the day, if I went to Halifax today and I go talk to 100 people in your community, they're all going to have different issues that they believe is the most important issue to them. How do you as mayor steer the ship? Because you have to look at the, the regional municipality, HRM, as a whole entity. You can't look at it as this community or this district by this district. You have to look at it as one entity. How do you drive the ship forward when you're trying to balance the needs of the few with the needs of all the community? So that's, that's, that's an issue that every city faces. I think it's particularly acute here. Halifax, a lot of people don't realize, is physically the size. It's bigger than Prince Edward Island. Uh, I remember when I was first elected mayor, going to the big city mayor's meeting and Jimmy Watson uh, hosted us and he put on a map the physical size of like Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Toronto. Then he put the physical size of Ottawa, which is 2,500 square kilometers, and it dwarfed all those. 
Ottawa is 2,500 square kilometers. We're 5,500 square kilometers. We have fishing communities. We have agricultural communities. We have gold mine. Uh, we have one of the most beautiful, pristine wilderness areas in the world called the 100 Wild Islands. Uh, and so the way that you sort of manage that, because you know, you can either look at it as a challenge and then you'll just, you'll never get over it. Or you can look at it as an opportunity to say, it's a great thing to have, you know, one of the truly great waterfronts in North America, which we have, uh, a vibrant downtown, more bars and, and uh, uh, pubs per capita than any other city in Canada. Um, and I know a good number of them. We, we have all of those things, but we also have this other thing. And it's not just a nice to have, and it's not just pretty, but it can be part of the economic development of the whole city. And, and as a mayor, I've always said the key is, if I'm going to go out to the community of Ecom Secom, I have to be prepared to say why it's important to invest in downtown Halifax. And if I'm in downtown Halifax, I have to be prepared to defend why we need to spend money to develop the rural parts of, of HRM. Because if you do it, I think it is an advantage. And um, there are people that would like to divide us up and just have the core of the city being the major metropolitan area. But then what do you do with the rest of the, uh, the rest of the community? So I, I prefer to look at it as an opportunity to link people together um, and, and pull it all together into what I think is the most uh, beautiful dynamic uh, city in Canada. And do people understand that? You, you talk about a few people who may want to divide this, the HRM into urban and rural communities, but do you believe that most people understand that the best way forward is as one and not as different entities? We, we, have, we have had councillors who, who, since we amalgamated in 19, mid-90s, we have had uh, people talk about the fact that it hasn't worked, but nobody's tried to, okay. nobody's tried to, uh, divide it up again. Um, and the reason is that it would be tremendously cumbersome. The, the former warden of the county of Halifax, who lived in Sheet Harbor when I ran for mayor, a very distinguished gentleman named Art McKenzie, said to me, Mike, don't, don't ever try to take this apart. You know, we're better off because we're part of HRM. And I, I think I believe that that's the case. No, there's all kinds of people that have all kinds of issues, but you know, there's probably people that don't want to you know be part of Nova Scotia don't want to be part of Canada or, and, and some that don't want to be part of HRM but it's not a burning issue um, as long as you respect the fact that there's differences I think at the end of the day you get the benefit of the doubt you are two years into your third term here and you have two years left remaining before you either decide to stand for re-election or retire now I'm not I'm not putting you on the spot of asking you which one you're doing now but I'm going to ask this question though what do you hope to accomplish? What is, the, what is the goal for Mayor Mike for the next two years? Is there one issue in 2024, if you got it accomplished, you say, I'm happy, I'm good. This is what I wanted to accomplish in this term. What is that issue for you? I would say that it would be that I'd, and it's, 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 it, this goes back to mayors being idealistic, but not ideological. I would like to be a city where people didn't, didn't need to live in tents um, or sheds in our city. I'd like to be a city where everybody uh, has a roof uh, and an opportunity to life. And um, I know we're all going through this, big cities, smaller cities, Fredericton, Moncton here. Um, we're all trying to figure this uh, piece out. Um, <clears throat> you know, but I'd like to make some real progress on the issue of, uh, of um, both housing, but particularly on homelessness. Uh, in the last year, our city has just gone exponentially, beyond exponentially in terms of the growth of what we've put into homelessness, you know, buying modular units for people to live, um, you know, investing in uh, providing support for people who are homeless, working with our service providers, identifying camping sites. And these, these are all things we, we didn't do. You know, the, that wasn't our responsibility. And so sometimes you can argue about jurisdiction. We're better off to figure out what needs to be done and then figure out who's going to do it. Anyway, I, we've had a good relationship with the province, particularly in the last year on the issue of homelessness. Uh, the minister is very committed to it. I think that the government is uh, writ large. Um, but like all cities in Canada, you know, homelessness didn't get the attention that it needed you know, really since we gave up on a national housing strategy 30 years ago. My last segment I want to talk about, because I'm just cautious of time here and we're coming up to the 40 minute mark, is tourism. 
I want to know from you, because we have listeners from across Canada and in Europe and in England and in Ireland, what are the hidden gems of Halifax? What, as a tourist, we, we all know the waterfront would be great to go see, but what are the hidden gems that people don't often talk about, but you would love people to go see in the HRM? We have a number of trails, some of which people might know, but a lot of which they don't. To come and, and hike, you can be on the water, you can be inland, you can be on pristine wilderness, you can be um, in forest. You know, we one of the things we we did as a city a few years that we we've bought land, we've bought land from developers, um, so that we can keep it as completely uh, pristine wilderness. So I think some of the trails are uh, impressive. Uh, we have some cool um, history in the city. We have a number of Canada's oldest churches, uh, including one that we share space with here at City Hall, the oldest wooden church in, uh, I think, in North America. Um, and if you come in on a cruise ship or you come in a visit, you can, uh, you know, you can check that out. We have really dynamic um, culture in in this city. There is, you know, we have a, we're just about to begin the Prismatic Arts Festival, which is. For groups that traditionally haven't uh, had the opportunity to, to showcase their talent. Um, so there's some of the traditional things people know about, but in terms of the festivals and events, there's some really cool things that we do in the city that if people are looking for something that they're not expecting, we're still getting cruise ships at this time of year. This is the fall in Nova Scotia and Halifax is a busy time of year uh, for cruise ships. People know about it, restaurants and things like that, but there's a lot of things that are beyond the main street that people can dig out and, and we got the uh, best okay. seafood, best lobsters in the world. I've had that argument with Dominic LeBlanc before. <laughs> um, for you though, after a very long uh, council meeting, after a stressful day, where's one place in this uh, HRM that you can go and decompress? Where's the one place? Is it a park? Is it a walking trail? Is it just your backyard? Where's the one place that you can go decompress? So I live near an area called Shuby Park, which is, um, you know, a trail in uh, the east end of Dartmouth. Um, I wouldn't go there after a long council meeting because it would be about midnight and uh, there's not a lot of lighting. Uh, but maybe I get up in the morning and go there. Um, that would be, you know, for me, that's that's my sort of um, quiet heaven when I'm looking for a bit of peace. That's uh, kind of where, uh, you know, where I go. But after a council meeting, I'll... Uh, generally go home and and uh you know watch uh hockey or baseball or football that's uh that's where i get my uh um that's where i relax and have fun and uh enjoy awesome and my last question well, to you. One thing too. Oh, we have ahead. a great premier league soccer team here in halifax now called the wanderers who have set up in, in the heart of the city um and that's it's really exciting we have a number of, you know we don't have the toronto maple leafs um which is a pretty good minor league team, or the Montreal Canadiens, which is a really good major league team. But we have the we have lacrosse, we have the junior hockey, which is the Mooseheads, we have the Wanderers. Uh, there's a lot of different things from a sports point of view here as well. What makes we HR... don't give away any of my allegiances? <laughs> hey, I'm a Ducks fan when it comes to hockey, and when it oh. comes to football, I'm a Tigers fan. So I am just all over the place with my allegiance. So that tells you where I am. Um, I want to ask the last question, and that it is, what makes the Halifax Regional Municipality, HRM, such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I'll give you two answers. The first one is the same thing that every other mayor will have told you, which is the people. Um, the people are special everywhere. We're proud of our people. Like anybody else, people will say, I think a lot of people will say it's the, it's the difference. I, I think for us, it's this sort of mid-sized premium city opportunity to be in a downtown that is just beyond bustling, but also be close to uh, the waterfront, to be close to some beautiful clean lakes, uh, some great hiking opportunities. You can be in a canoe. Um, I think the quality of life is exceptional. We hear that from companies that there was over 20 companies that chose to come and set up in Halifax during COVID. Um, and some of them had never been to Halifax before, uh, but they saw that we had handled COVID well. They saw that we have young talent. Um, and, uh, you know, we've become a tech hub in the last five years. I don't think that's something people anticipated. Um, 
And, and the last thing I'd say is we're one of the few cities that's actually gotten younger over the last few years. Um, and, you know, uh, I, it's not me, um, you know, where I'm now in that demographic that uh, we used to have a lot of, um, but we all want the young minds, the young energy, the, the young passion that fuels innovation um, in our city. And we've actually gotten younger and that's, uh, that's a good thing. Doesn't mean we don't like folks who are my age, um, but we all want that young energy and we've been, we've been getting that. Well, uh, Mayor Mike, I want to thank you so much for sitting down for the last 40, almost 45 minutes now and talking about yourself and your community. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, look, I appreciate it, Chris, very much. I have to go call Danny Breen and chew him out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's a pleasure. I love, I love talking to other municipal politicians from communities of all sizes. And uh, I think it's a great thing you're doing to, to take some time to chat with us. So thank you. Well, no, I think municipal politics is the forgotten politics when it comes to the national issues, and we need to start talking about them. So thank you so much. So with that, this has been Municipal Month for October 2022 on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, put down Twitter, put down tw Facebook, put down Instagram, and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy, it helps our society, and it helps us be a better people with, at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.